I am delighted to introduce today's panel of experts who work at the intersection of dementia and speech sciences. All three of our presenters today are connected with the School of Audiology and Speech Sciences at the University of British Columbia as professor, associate professor, or PhD candidate. Dr. Jeff Small is a professor and he's also a researcher in the Center for Research on Personhood in Dementia at UBC. Dr. Small's research investigates how persons with dementia and their care partners may benefit from using memory and communication strategies in their everyday interactions. He and his collaborators have created and implemented communication enhancement training programs for caregivers in both institutional and family care settings. Dr. Tammy Howe is an associate professor in the same School of Audiology and Speech Sciences. Prior to obtaining her PhD, Tammy worked for several years as a speech language pathologist with adults with communication disorders in Canada and in New Zealand. Tammy's research focuses on exploring how we can enhance the everyday lives of adults living with communication disorders caused by dementia or stroke. Catherine Davies, last but not least, is a PhD candidate and a registered speech language pathologist. Before starting her PhD, Catherine completed two masters, one in linguistics and the other in speech language pathology. Her research focuses on understanding the communication needs and concerns of people living with primary progressive aphasia and their family members. A very warm welcome to each of you. Uh, thank you, Laurie. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone and share information about speech language pathologists and how we can support the communication of those living with dementia. So as Laurie mentioned, there's three of us presenting today. So I'll be covering uh, the first third followed by Jeff Small and then Tammy Howe. So starting with the first topic. So what are speech language pathologists? Uh, we, we are allied healthcare professionals. Uh, we specialize in assessing and treating communication disability uh, as well as swallowing impairments. Uh, we are perhaps most known for our work with children, but we do work with adults and we work with adults living with dementia and their families. Uh, and we provide communication care. So what do we do? We help people who are living with dementia and their family understand the communication changes that are happening. Uh, we help to identify uh, specific communication challenges. We help to find ways of supporting the communication of the person living with dementia and their family members. We can also do other things such as screening for hearing changes. And we can make referrals to other healthcare professionals as well, such as an audiologist or an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist. So specifically with people living with dementia and their families, what can speech pathologists do? Well, as I mentioned, we can provide communication care by working with the person living with dementia and their family to identify what is important to them. So communication care might look like, for example, supporting meaningful conversations with loved ones <clears throat> such as providing individualized communication partner training for family or friends or other care partners. We might support participation in important life events and leisure activities, which could include a variety of supports, such as providing tailored communication aids, including activity-specific communication books or activity cards. Um, we can also help to maintain social connections with family and friends. Uh, for example, that might look like the creation of a memory book to support communication. 
so what else do speech language pathologists do in the community? We also advocate for communication accessibility. We educate the public and other healthcare professionals that about communication changes and avenues for providing support. We can also make changes to the environment, which might support several individuals living with dementia to support their communication. Uh, and that might look like, for example, reducing background noises or other visual or cognitive distractions, providing external cues in the environment, or as I mentioned, communication partner training to communication partners. There are two main avenues to identifying a speech language pathologist. Uh, one is through the health system. So speech language pathologists are available to people living with a communication disability through uh, our health system in acute care, rehabilitation, um, not everywhere, but increasingly long-term care and not everywhere, but increasingly in the community. Uh, one caveat uh, here is that the wait lists can be quite long and the level of services can sometimes be limited, but hopefully this will improve in the future. Another avenue to finding a speech language pathologist is by finding a private SLP uh, who are often covered through extended health insurance. I'm just going to exit out of the presentation now and show you the website on the screen where you can find a speech language pathologist. Um, so here you go to this link. This is what it will look like. You click on find a professional, scroll right down. Here is the map of speech language pathologists in BC. If you click advanced search, click on disorder, scroll down to dementia, and click search. It will think for a while. And there we go. Okay. So here are the lists. It's not exhaustive, but a list of all the SLPs registered on this site who uh, provide services to people living with dementia. You can go through on the map or you can just scroll right down and find their contact information there. I'm passing, passing it off now. All right. Thank you, Kate. Uh, it's great to be here. I want to uh, reiterate what Kate said at the beginning in terms of acknowledging the Alzheimer's Society of BC uh, for their good work in supporting people with dementia and their care partners. And we love doing these kind of presentations because the outreach is quite impactful. So I am a researcher. I also teach in the school in the area of adult uh, communication disorders, including age-related disorders and dementia. Um, and for the last 30 years, I've focused my research on communication strategies and barriers to effective communication uh, when a person has Alzheimer's disease. So I'm going to be referring to some of this research. It's not just me. It's a lot of collaborators. Uh, and it's people who have done other work elsewhere beyond uh, the boundaries of this university or even Canada. So I want to acknowledge that this is a collective effort and we all learn from each other. And then we hope to pass that information on to, to people who can use it in their day-to-day -day lives. And so I hope this presentation, this webinar does uh, bring you some nuggets of, of uh, tangibles that you can take and try out in your daily life. Due to the short, relatively short time that I have to present today, I'm not gonna be able to present a lot of detail on everything I say. So please jot down any questions uh, or comments in the chat, and then we can hopefully get to those as we move forward with the discussion. So um, next slide, yeah. I wanna start off uh, when we're talking about um, communication challenges and communication strategies. I think it's really important to ground what I'm about to say in the rest of this presentation in the actual experiences of people with dementia. And when I use the term dementia, I'm using it primarily to refer to Alzheimer's. I know there's many other types of dementia and neurodegenerative disorders associated with aging, and those are very important variations, um, but I'm focusing on the most common type, Alzheimer's. And so when I use the word dementia, it's referring to uh, Alzheimer's. So the person's experience with Alzheimer's is really important for helping understand why certain communication behaviors might happen 
and what it is that they are seeking in terms of support from their conversational partners. Um, and then I also want to look at the, the care partners view of communication and some of the things that they struggle with. And then we combine those and, and let those uh, perspectives inform the kinds of questions we ask in our research. So I'm just gonna read through uh, several quotes, first from the perspective of the person with dementia and then um, from the care partners. And some of these are from my own research and some are from a very valuable resource that's uh, noted at the bottom of this slide. So this person said, do not talk to me as though you are speaking to a child. Please listen to me and believe what I am telling you about my experiences. Don't get angry when I repeat myself. Communication is challenging when I cannot find the right words. My vocabulary gets lost and my mind goes blank. And this next one is similar in terms of the, the struggle that a person is, is feeling cognitively. There are times when I feel normal. Other times I cannot follow what is going on around me. The conversation whips too fast from person to person before I process one comment, the thread has moved on to another person or another topic. And I'm left feeling isolated from the action, alone in the crowd. If I press myself with greatest concentration and try to keep up, I feel as though something short circuits in my brain. So that's the care, the, the person with dementia's perspective on what they're experiencing. Now let's look at some quotes from a care part for from many different care partners. First one, sometimes I find it difficult when he is home and sits there not talking. I have to do the talking, but it's like to the wall. I don't get anything back. She forgot that she never had a shower. I'd say, well, it's time for a shower. And she'd say, I just showered five minutes ago. And then she'd dig in. I'm not going to have another shower. I just had one. And I say, no, you didn't have one. So on and on it goes. Next quote, I've learned not to discuss anything in advance. If I, if I say we're going to do something later, he'll want to get ready right then to do it, and it's a total nuisance. So yeah, I don't ever talk about anything more than what we are going to do immediately. Next one. I think one thing that probably drives caregivers up the wall is repetition over and over again, asking you the same thing. And similarly, this last one, his memory is terrible. 50 times a day, he'll ask me what day it is or what time it is. His memory for way back, his childhood memories, fantastic. So again, the contrast there between the short-term memory and uh, longer-term remote memories. So these examples from both the person with dementia and the care partners illustrate both the devastating impact that dementia can have on communication and interpersonal uh, interactions as well as functioning in daily lives, but they also emphasize the importance of maintaining the dignity of the person with dementia. Many of the communication challenges faced by people with dementia and their care partners stem from how the disease affects language, memory, and other cognitive abilities. So it would make sense then that the strategies we come up with to help improve communication should address or target these declining abilities. And I'll talk more about this later. The point I want to make now is, however, is that language and memory are just one part of the picture of what enables us to be good communicators. Next slide. What I mean by that is communication is often construed as simply an exchange between two or more people of some verbal information and then some nonverbal behaviors. And that is the messages that are, that are interpreted. And that's what people often leave communication at. But what some researchers over 50 years ago by the name of names of Watts, Wall, Watts Lawick, Bevan and Jackson said is that it's not just the content dimension, the verbal and nonverbal that contributes to meaningful communication. It's also another dimension, which is a relationship aspect or what I'm calling here, connecting space. Uh, next bullet there, connecting space, that intersecting part. What is connecting space? Well, it's really how the participants connect to, to each other in the moment of that interaction. What are their attitudes towards each other, their feelings, and their behaviors? 
are they inviting the other person or are they discouraging the other person from engaging in that conversation? And what I want to stress here is that this connecting space, this relational space, if you will, it's, it's important to note that this space actually filters. So if we have the next bullet there, this space actually, well, that's actually showing the, the connecting space actually being bigger or more overlapping, or it can actually pull apart and the circles are almost independent of each other. But what this filter represents is that the connecting space can actually filter or modulate the content dimension, that is what is said, such that the person with the dementia may, may actually shut down and not process the content dimension because the conversational partner treats them as incompetent. In other words, they're not having a positive connecting vibe. So the size of this overlapping connecting space increases when there's positive relational behaviors being exhibited. And conversely, that connecting space shrinks and the circles pull apart when there are negative or indifferent attitudes or behaviors shown. So in a nutshell, connecting space sets the tone for how one is going to relate to and be perceived by the other person. Now, within this, or surrounding this interaction of content and connections is the context. So that includes where is this conversation taking place? Is it in the home? Is it in a public setting, grocery store or park? What is the activity? Is it simply an informal conversation about family or is it involved in carrying out a task in the home? Are there other people involved in the conversation? What are their characteristics? Are they familiar or are they not acquaintances? Uh, what are the goals and expectations of each partner in that interaction? And do these goals and expectations align with each other or not? All of those can determine to what extent there's going to be a connection. One other thing I wanted to say is that the conversational context can lead to the use of specific verbal and nonverbal behaviors and influence how we connect to the other person. For example, if the context is a familiar setting, like a person's home, then one can draw on that familiarity when conversing. For example, referring to things in the home to support that person's understanding. A public setting, on the other hand, may require one to think more carefully about reducing distractions or noise and being more aware of including the person with dementia and supporting them in conversations when others are present. So, all of that to say, in terms of a communication uh, framework, that this, this notion of there being a content dimension, which is the verbal and nonverbal behaviors, and then this more relational, emotional side of connecting, those two dimensions informed uh, a communication training program that Joanne Perry, a colleague in nursing here at UBC, and I developed a number of years ago. And that program is called Traced. And a person by the name of uh, Susan Lane, who's a geriatrician uh, in Ontario, noticed or came across our training program and said, hey, that really needs to get into the hands of more people and have more press. So she said, how about I create or work on creating a whiteboard animation that captures some of the essence of our traced communication strategies? And, and then we present that to a wider audience. And that's what she did with the help of the Ontario Alzheimer's Society. And so that's what we're going to show now. I think so, but Alzheimer's disease affects communication between family members and relatives with Alzheimer's. You as a family member can adjust your communication to meet the needs of your relative with Alzheimer's disease and to meet your own needs. <laughs> we present evidence-informed suggestions to enhance your communication for relatives with Alzheimer's disease. Several of these strategies come from a program developed by Professors Jeff Small and Joanne Perry called Training and Communication Enhancement for Dementia, the TRACED program. The strategies are a combination of compensatory approaches and connecting techniques. 
Useful compensatory strategies are, number one, use one idea per sentence. That is, use only one verb. For example, I moved the telephone to the bedroom versus I moved the telephone from the kitchen and placed it in the bedroom. Number two, ask questions that limit demands on recent memory and provide options for answering. For example, do you want to read the newspaper versus did you read the newspaper this morning? Number three, speak at a normal rate using regular, not exaggerated intonation. Number four, eliminate distractions. That is sounds, sights, or smells that do not go with what you are saying or writing. Useful connecting strategies are, number one, encourage, support participation through prompting and cueing. For example, get the pea soup from the shelf right here. Good for you. You got all of the grocery items on our list. Number two, invite, offer choices and preferences. For example, do you want to go for a walk on the trail or go for a drive in the car? Number three, facilitate. If they struggle with conversational responses, try supplying a possible answer. For example, maybe we to tell her, you know, do you mean we should call her? Yes. Number four, orchestrate. Provide guidance to assist in activities. For example, if they forget where to place a dish, provide a demonstration. Number five, partner. Draw on shared memories, telling stories with sentences containing simple grammar and one idea. Do an enjoyable activity together. These strategies, among many other useful ones, can be beneficial to your relative with Alzheimer's disease and to your family members. For additional education and training on how to communicate effectively using person-focused strategies, please contact the Alzheimer's Society of Canada or your local, provincial, or municipal chapters of the Alzheimer's Society. We all strive to improve the quality of life for our family and friends who have Alzheimer's disease because we care and they need us to care. All right. Well, we provided a link to that if you want to watch it again later some point. Um, so yeah, before I move on to elaborate on some of the things in that video, um, I just want to mention several things that that's important to keep in mind in relation to how Alzheimer's disease affects communication and how to adapt effectively to the changes that you see. The first thing is for is is for of foremost importance, and that is keep in mind that each person brings their unique current abilities, their unique background, and a shared history with you to the conversation. Um, they are their their abilities to communicate messages through verbal and nonverbal channels may fluctuate from day to day, even from hour to hour and minute to minute. But the need to have others respect them and their personhood does not diminish and it may actually increase over time. So that's really important. Second thing, there may be an increasing reliance on nonverbal behaviors as their linguistic and memory abilities decline. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that communication is a wonderful system that is multifaceted and resilient such that when one modality, uh, for example, verbal language is affected, other modalities such as nonverbal behaviors can step in and help fill the gap. Thirdly, in dementia, not everything declines at the same rate. And in fact, there are preserved abilities. For example, in participating in a conversation, a person with dementia can appropriately take turns um, to speak. They can ask for clarification when they don't understand, and they can obviously express their, their needs and opinions. Um, 
This can also be modulated or affected by how much support they're getting from a care partner. And that's where accommodation uh, through communication strategies comes into play, which we'll talk about in the remainder of my presentation. Lastly, but not least, in fact, it may be also really, really important is it's often overlooked um, that sensory abilities, a person's hearing and vision are not so central to, to communication outcomes. But we've learned over the last decade, especially that not correcting or accounting for a person's hearing or vision loss can actually uh, lead to communication breakdowns, lead to social isolation, and to further cognitive decline. So it can actually accelerate cognitive decline. So addressing a person's hearing needs, even if they don't have a hearing aid and maybe haven't had a hearing assessment recently, it still is important because the majority of older people have some hearing loss for that to be in the forefront of your minds. Okay, so on to traced communication strategies. I hope you noticed when watching that, that whiteboard animation that the trace connecting and compensatory strategies map pretty readily onto the relationship side of the model that I presented earlier and the content dimensions. And so what I'd like to do now is elaborate a little bit on the reasoning behind the different strategies and provide examples of key strategies. So first, connecting strategies. Connecting is the feeling one has when one shares a meaning or understanding with another person. I think we can all relate to that. We say things like, I connected to that person. It involves affirming and supporting a person's need and desire for meaningful communication. So connecting is emotional and it's relational. And when a person has been in a long-standing relationship, like they often are in a family, the connecting dimension can often be taken for granted. And so what happens is when one's family member with dementia has start showing changes in their verbal and nonverbal capacities, often caregivers don't realize that they need to adjust or reset their connecting approach as well. That is, you can't connect necessarily the same way because the person's other aspect of communication, namely verbal and nonverbal capacities, have changed. So it's important to revisit how one is relating to a family member uh, who has Alzheimer's disease. Compensatory strategies. Compensating is adjusting the way one talks, and I might add, one behaves nonverbally to help reduce the information processing demands on the person with dementia. I just wanna comment now briefly about just the nature of communication and conversation and how demanding it can be. We usually don't think about the demands of com communication until there's a breakdown. But when you consider in normal everyday conversation, a person speaks about two to three words per second on average, that means over a 10 to 15 second period, a person has to retrieve from 20 to 45 words from their mental lexicon, assemble those words into a sentence structure, and then make sense of that whole string of words as an utterance. For the person with dementia, the processing capacity to do this becomes compromised due to declines in word finding ability, working memory, and attention. And what this means for conversational partners is that they need to accommodate to the person's more limited processing power by simplifying what they say. Otherwise, the processing demands may exceed the person's capacity and that leads to a communication breakdown. I'd like to provide a simple analogy which is gonna date myself, um, but referring back to the early days of the first computers, I can remember running multiple programs at once, for example, Word and Excel, and the computer freezing due to the lack of RAM or processing power. I would then have to close all those applications and sometimes even reboot my computer to get things to work again. What I learned through trial and error was how to restrict the number of demands I was making on my computer at any one point in time which you could think of as my way of accommodating to the computer's limited processing power. Well, that analogy may help in understanding 
why compensatory strategies should be used, but how do these type of strategies work alongside connecting strategies? One way to think about the relationship between connecting and compensating is that we cannot effectively compensate if we haven't first connected with the other person. There can be an affective or emotional barrier. Similarly, our efforts to connect with the person can be hindered or less effective if we don't know how to appropriately compensate. So in this way, the relational and content aspects are mutually reinforcing and they need to work hand in hand. Next slide. So in this slide, I have a number of strategies listed and I'll be providing some examples, specific examples in the following two slides. But here I'm just going to cover some of the main strategies that were in the video and ones that we have focused on in our research. First in the connecting realm, invite. So assuming competence, that's really providing the appropriate supports and use of strategies so that person can function as a viable communication partner. They can function to the best of their capacity. Topic initiation is something that people with dementia have difficulty with. So the care partner being ready to supply possible topics to help start a conversation. The second one, facilitate and orchestrate. I like what a person with dementia said in this, in this regard, uh, which is about providing context, prompts, cues, giving the person options, guiding but not controlling, or speaking for, and then helping when they need help. Here's what a person with dementia said, quote, ask me if I want help with a word, but do not rush in to finish my sentences, unquote. The next, and I'll be giving further example of, of these in the next slides. Validate and encourage. Observe and affirm the person's feelings and nonverbal behaviors. So this is one area where perhaps we could agree with Donald Trump, which is feelings trump facts. Facts sometimes aren't so important when you're talking. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they aren't, and you can dismiss or let something go if the person is saying something that doesn't quite align with your interpretation of reality. So don't spiral into arguments in order to defend facts. Next one, draw upon shared memories. I like a comment that one, per one participant said uh, or shared in last week's webinar on this uh, um, for the Alzheimer's Society. She said, quote, I love seeing my mom smile and laugh with me. I try to make some stories funny to watch her reaction. I love that quote and I love that attitude. So later on in today's webinar, Tammy will be sharing ideas on how to support a person's drawing upon memories in a conversation. Next area is compensating strategies. First one is reducing distractions and background noise, not over or under stimulating the person. A person with dementia may experience attentional overload due to distractions or number of people in an environment or even the complexity of the topic. So that would be overstimulation. Or there could be understimulation, which could be from, for example, sensory loss, so a hearing loss or not having their glasses on. Another could be more of an external source for um, understimulation, and that is related to what a caregiver said uh, earlier on that I presented, which is, she said, I have to do all the talking. It's like talking to a wall. Well, what happens when that scenario plays out is the person, the care partner feels like I'm, this is a one-sided conversation. I'm not, it's not worth my time. And they withdraw from conversations and this leads to understimulation. Second area is use one idea per sentence and speak clearly. So the next bullet as well, speak clearly and at a normal rate. I'll come back to these in a couple of slides, as well as this last area I will return to in a couple of slides. Choose and respond to questions to treat strategically. So I wanna talk about that one from both the standpoint of the care partner's um, behaviors, as well as the uh, person with dementia uh, in terms of their repetitive questioning. So first, let's go on to give some specific examples of connecting strategies. So next slide. 
So invite, how do we invite? Here's a couple examples. So you can comment on what a person is wearing. It's a beautiful sweater. Is it warm? Um, or did you see our neighbor's new dog? And then depending on the response from the person, you might invite them or you might elaborate on what they say or invite them to say something further about whatever they said. So you could say, it reminds me of a sweater I had when we lived in such and such place. Or regarding the dog, I think it's a German Shepherd. Let's take a walk later and see if it's outside. Second connecting strategy here is facilitating and orchestrating. Person with dementia says, I can't find my book. The care partner responds, do you mean your address book? So again, trying to interpret more specifically what kind of book and asking for clarification. That's a kind of facilitating uh, approach. Let's start by looking where you usually keep it. So here, they're not asking the person to go off and, and look for it. They're actually asking, looking to do it as a partnering activity. So that's what orchestrate means. It means guide the person towards finding the information they, they are interested in knowing. Second example, do you prefer to do blank by yourself or would you like some help? So this is important in the sense of positioning or treating the person as though they have some agency, that they still can do some things independently, but at the same time offering assistance so that they don't feel like they are stranded or that you're expecting them to do it all on their, all on their own. Next strategy, validate and encourage. So this is really getting at the feelings behind uh, why a person is presenting be the behaviors they are. Are you sad or upset about something? Do you wanna talk about it? So giving them that open door if they do wanna talk about it. And then just acknowledging, which is was a main message in last week's webinar of how difficult this journey is. It's hard. We're, we're, we're dealing with a very hard health condition that impacts us in every aspect of our life, but we're gonna take this on together. So encouragement. Next one, I think that's all for that. Yeah, so moving on to now specific strategies um, related to questions asked by the care partner and then how to deal with repetitive questions. So the literature and websites that offer communication strategies for people with dementia and their care partners often say to use yes, no, and choice questions rather than open-ended questions. However, I've done some research that kind of tries to tease apart if that's necessarily the case or whether there might be um, settings or conditions under which either question type is appropriate. And sure enough, yes, different questions may be more suitable for specific contexts or goals in the conversation. So if the main goal of a conversation is to help someone get through a task or a procedure and it's more urgent, then yes or no, yes, yes, no questions or choice questions may help the person stay on topic and be less frustrated as they try to both get the job done as well as process what is being said. On the other hand, if it's less time constrained activity, like having just a conversation about family, um, then with appropriate support, the person can often effectively respond to open-ended questions. So Tammy will be talking later about a memory book that can be used to help guide the person's uh, thoughts and recall of things that are from their past. Again, making reference as much as you can to feelings rather than specific details that the person has to retrieve from a past event. That's important. Secondly, whoops, avoid testing the person's episodic memory. What is episodic memory? Memories about things that have happened in the past, either the recent past, like yesterday or last week, or the more remote past, which is five years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago. So a care partner often, in, in a study that I did, care partners often started a question with, do you remember? 
which can come across as trying to test the person's memory. And because memories attached to specific details of recent personal experience may not have even been encoded by the person into their memory, it's no use asking if they remember details from that event. And it makes them feel incompetent. Instead, instead try something like, I was thinking about the time we tried paddle boarding. How did you like that? Did you enjoy the challenge? Another thing that people often refer to is the better recall of memories from the remote past than the recent past. And yes, there's evidence for this. I did a study once that found that. But even when we talk about memories from the more distant past, the person with dementia may benefit from using external supports and context to help them relive and recall uh, their feelings and, and their experience of that event. So things like showing them photos, videos, objects, those are all external supports. And Tammy will talk more about this in a few minutes. All right, lastly, I wanna talk about a, uh, a concern that many care partners have, and that was raised in last week's webinar as well by participants. And that is repetitive questioning or other repetitive behaviors such as frequent phone calls by the person with dementia. These can be frustrating because they're just so reoccurring and it kind of gets on your nerves. It's not that the person with dementia is intentionally doing it. Of course they're not. They do simply do not remember having asked that question a few minutes ago or seconds ago. So the first thing to do is acknowledge the reasons or feelings behind the questioning. You may not, those, those may not be obvious. So we think about possible reasons or feelings behind the question. Did the person recently lose their driver's license? That's why they're asking for their keys. Does not having keys in their pocket make them feel like something is missing? So try to get at that source rather than just dismissing it as an unfounded, repeated questioning. Is the person afraid of missing the doctor's appointment? Secondly, redirect attention away from what they're fixating on. So for example, in the case of where are my keys, you could say, let's go look in the living room. And then once you're in the living room, you can divert their attention to something else. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but that's another possible way of dealing with that fixation on a particular question they have. Lastly, use spaced retrieval training to help them self-cue to the answer. Um, I think the best way for me to illustrate this is to provide an example from my dad's experience. My dad had vascular dementia. I was visiting him one time and he kept asking me, when is my sister going to come to visit him? And I would tell him the answer. And then a few minutes later, he'd ask me the same question. And I had recently been doing some space retrieval training in my research, and I thought, hmm, this looks like a good opportunity for space retrieval. So I said, Dad, how about we do some space retrieval training? And I pulled the calendar off the wall, and I circled the date when my sister was going to come to visit him. And I said, now, every time you think about and want to know when Marilyn is going to come for a visit, you can look at the calendar. And then I asked him, so what can you do if you want to remember when Marilyn's going to visit? And he said, well, I can look at the calendar. I said, yeah. And then I set the calendar aside. I wait a minute and I ask him again. So dad, what can you do if you want to remember when, Ma when Marilyn is going to visit? And he says right away, oh, I can look at the calendar. And then I wait two minutes. So the idea is you double the interval between when you prompt him with the question and when he recalls what he's supposed to do to remember that piece of information. And so you double it two minutes, four minutes, eight, 16, up to 32 minutes typically in one session of training. So that's what I did with my dad. And each time he was able to immediately say, oh, I can look at the calendar. So I put the calendar back on the wall. The next day we're having breakfast and all of a sudden he catches himself and he says, oh, I know what you're gonna say. And so what he was thinking is, when is Marilyn gonna come and visit? And he remembered, oh, I can look at the calendar. And so he didn't even ask me the question. This has occurred over and over in different space retrieval research um, studies that this, this can actually cause people to avert asking the question over and over again because they can self-cue themselves to the answer. 
All right, I know I'm running on and on here, but I do want to briefly mention one other strategy before we go on because it's so widely recommended, but it may not be useful depending on how it is interpreted and applied, and that is speaking slowly. So why might slowing your speech not be helpful? Well, as mentioned in last week's webinar, it could be perceived as condescending or baby talk. Where are we going? And it can increase the demands on working memory because you're stretching the speech over a longer period of time. So what's recommended instead is that you keep your speech simple by conveying one idea at a time, checking for the person's comprehension, and then moving on to the next idea. So as one person with dementia said, allow me time to think, find the right word, answer questions, or write down my thoughts. Ask people to slow down and use shorter sentences. So the takeaway here is that it may be most appropriate and helpful to interpret speaking slowly as reducing the amount of information you're including in one utterance not slowing each word and stretching it out, but reducing the content amount. All right, last slide. Just wanna kind of summarize and hopefully encapsulate everything in this little schematic here. We start off, or we should start off by looking ways to invite, validate, and affirm our conversational partner. Then by observing them, we can consider what compensatory strategies verbal and nonverbal, may be useful based on the person's behaviors, including their emotional state. Third, we then compensate. We try a compensatory strategy and see whether it seems to help the person communicate. And then it cycles back. We reflect or consider how we might modify that strategy or choose another strategy to use and see what effect that might have on their ability to successfully communicate, all the while trying to make sure that we're maintaining a good connection with the person. So at that, I'll leave it off to, I'll send it off to Tammy and look forward to the discussion time. Great, thanks, Jeff. I'm gonna talk um, a bit about memory books for people with dementia. So it's one type of intervention that we do in speech therapy that we have some research for. And it's something, I'm when I talk about the memory books today, I'm gonna to give you some suggestions so that if you are interested, you can do this yourselves. Um, what a memory book is, is taking photos and simple written statements about positive aspects of a person's life um, and using it as a, an aid to support positive conversations between people with dementia and various conversation partners. And it can be um, often used with people with mild and moderate dementia, but can be useful for some people who have more severe dementia as well. So this is just an example of um, some pages that you might have in a memory book. Um, this is my book of memories might be the cover of a book, the simple photo. Another photo, this is my wife, Maureen. I've lived in this home since 1991. This is my daughter, Rebecca, and my granddaughter, Lisa. I enjoy fishing with my friends, Ray and Jack. I owned the Bellevue Barbershop for over 20 years. So why are memory books useful? They provide a concrete support um, that can help prompt positive conversations and provide that social connection that everyone needs, including people with dementia. The photos can reduce the need, um, photos with the written information, reduce that memory demand for people by giving them the specific words or events that they might want to be talking about. The written word also doesn't disappear like the spoken word does. So that can reduce a person's memory of knowing what topic we're talking about. We found and our researchers have found a simple print in context with some familiar photos can be read by some people even 
very far into uh, a person's dementia for some people. It provides a joint focus so that people can draw on those shared memories that Jeff was talking about and can facilitate a sense of closeness for people with dementia and their family. For people with dementia who are talking with less familiar conversation partners, such as staff people at a long-term care facility or volunteers or friends that they don't see as much, that the memory book can serve as an important um, aid for knowing what the topic is and knowing about some things that are important to the person that they might want to talk about. It's also very useful supporting the person's um, sense of a positive identity and it promote, promotes positive reminiscence and positive emotion. So how do you put a memory book together? So if possible, should be you know working with the person with dementia to develop the memory book and figure out what is going to be important to put into it and choose some important positive facts and information that they might want to talk about or that's important to them. So if these are some examples, maybe you know where they went to school, positive highlights in their work life, in their personal life, hobbies and pastimes, places they've traveled, and important people in their lives. How we put memory books together, you find clear photo for each of the facts or piece of information that you want to include in the book. And you can use other items that, you know, sports tickets, when you used to have actual physical sports tickets and concert programs and invitations and maps. You put one photo on each page using a white background, you can have 20 pages or, or more, um, and label with simple sentences. Something that most people don't think of, but you use the first person. So it's that it's my memory book. So you say you use sentences with I, my, our, we. Print the sentences clearly or type the words using some good, clear font. And then you can organize the memory book either chronologically or by topic. And some people like to use tabs with different um, topics listed on them, such as my family or my life. Um, these are just some suggestions that family members and different people have found useful. Um, using a three ring binder with plastic page protectors has been useful um, because you can change the pages and, and adapt them as you need or, or add pages or remove pages over time. Or using a large photo album um, is also another option. Some people prefer to scan the photos in um, and, or take photos of old photos that they have with their phone and then print them out in color on the computer just so that you're not damaging the original photo and that you have a backup copy of the book. Other people prefer to have memory wallets um, because they're portable and particularly if people go out a lot and they want to have the memory book as something they could refer to during a um, conversation. It could be in their purse or in their pocket. And so some people um, have made smaller versions of, of these memory books. So as the person's dementia progresses, um, you likely need to reduce the amount of information in the book, um, use shorter um, phrases, and reduce the number of pages. So this is just an example. Um, this would maybe um, someone's granddaughter, and you have the same photo. You originally got something like, my granddaughter Sarah lives in Kelowna. I love baking with my granddaughter. Over time, that maybe is too long. Um, and so you use the same photo, but a different um, set of um, sentences. I have one granddaughter, her name is Sarah. And um, if it later it becomes, that's too difficult, then you might have a very short phrase, my granddaughter, Sarah, underneath the photo, same photo. Similarly, as um, a person's dementia uh, progresses, they may need the font of the print to be larger. Um, so you might start with something very, very small, um, like 12 um, point font and go all the way up, you know, up to say a 40 point font. So these are just a few examples of how memory books can be used. So some families enjoy going through the book regularly with their family member with dementia and the, you use it as a shared context for conversation and really focusing on that positive social connection and drawing on those shared memories. So the person with dementia might read aloud the statements, 
elaborate on the topics, may, you know, add things, new things, different times, or, or talk about some of the similar things over, over time. Um, the communication partner then would be using all of the strategies that Jeff talked about, the connecting and compensatory strategies, you know, making sure you're, before you're even starting the conversation, you're making sure the distractions are reduced. Everybody who needs hearing aids has their hearing aid on. Um, and that you're inviting the person to have a, a conversation about, you know, this, about something in their life. Um, if they have difficulties, um, help them out, provide reassurance, you know, something like that's okay. I think Market Square is where you bought that delicious fish, right? So they're in this situation, they're giving, you know, what they think the person was trying to say. Um, as Jeff said, you're not quizzing the person, you're not asking them a lot of specific questions now. Who is this person? I know you know, who is it? It's it's about this positive social connection. And so um, we're avoiding those types of specific questions, not correcting or contradicting something that was stated, even if you know it's wrong. So, you know, no, that's not John, that's Jason. Remember your grandson, Jason. Um, you know, rather, you know, you might say, you know, all that, yeah, kind of, John kind of looks like Jason, um, you know, just um, yeah, not cor correcting or, or contradicting them, um, just accepting it and um, moving on and having focusing on that positive connection. Um, memory books are also sometimes used with volunteers or visitors or the long-term care rehabilitation assistants or staff. And this is just an example from Michelle Bourgeois, who's the main speech pathology researcher who's look, you know, worked and done a lot of investigations on using memory books. And she's just got a, um, a description of how a memory book, um, how the conversation sort of evolved over time with one person who had a memory book. The um, visitor volunteer with the assistance of a family had developed a memory wallet and it had 30 pages, um, including a photo that said, I was a high school teacher for 30 years before retiring. So on the second visit, before the volunteer, or before reading aloud the page about being a high school teacher, um, the, Marion said, I bet you didn't know that I taught just about every grade and subject in all those years. My first teaching job was a fifth grade social studies class. And this you know, was definitely a very, very important memory for her. On the back of the page, she had written a list of the schools, grade levels, and subjects that she had taught over her life. Later, um, you know, much later, as her dementia progressed, the volunteer with, visitor was still coming to visit using the memory wallet. And Marion would read the first page until the last page. And then when she got to the end, she'd start rereading it again. And then they would do that for a while and then the volunteer would say, well, let's have a snack or have some tea now. As, as the Marion's dementia progressed even further, um, the volunteer was still coming and would go through the memory book with Marion and she would smile when asked to talk about her life. She would hold the memory book and didn't start reading. The volunteer would read the first page aloud and Marion smiled and would pat the photo. She repeated this with each photo as the volunteer read each page aloud on occasion, repeating a word the volunteer had said, really using her nonverbal communication to indicate, you know, how much, you know, how important this was to her and having that connection with the volunteer. Other ways memory books can be used in people that are in the early stages of dementia sometimes use more of a, a memory notebook. So it might be something where they, maybe they on their own or have had some help to list all the important people, names of people in their lives, things they want to remember on different pages, and they might use have some tabs in a little notebook, and they might carry that around in their pocket or in a purse and bring it out during a conversation if they're trying to think of something, or maybe sometimes, you know, reviewing some of those things before they're going into a, a group conversation so that they remember some of the things they wanted to say and um, talk about. Other family members have um, developed specific interest memory books where you focus on a, just one particular topic or activity, such as the person's favorite vacations and trips, their garden or cooking. So that's the end of my section on memory books and wanna thank you for listening. And I think we're gonna open it up for questions now. Yes, indeed we are. I 
have several questions. Thank you, everybody. And thank I, I know I'm going to say it again at the end, but thank you so much to the three of you. That was really marvelous. I was taking a lot of notes. Um, so going through the questions, and I'm just going to let you guys sort out amongst yourselves. Is there a typical progression time for the loss of language completely? Well, <clears throat> yeah, that's a question that's often asked, or at least the, the progressive kind of nature of dementia and you know how how fast do, does a person go through the stages it's very individual and i've worked with families and persons with dementia who have progressed in a matter of 3 or 4 years where they lose much of their language and then i've worked with other individuals who have 10 12 years behind them and they're still able to converse fine they may they have obviously memory problems but they can converse so this is not something you can predict for any one individual. Um, you kind of have to monitor how they're doing at this point and how they've done in the last few months or years. And that may give you some sense of where it's going from there, but not necessarily. Tammy or Kate? If I could also add in a healthcare setting, um, sometimes that information can come most from a neurologist or a physician as it depends on the person. Uh, but a speech language pathologist working in the healthcare system or privately can help access that information from the neurologist or physician. We might have access to information they've written or we can contact them more easily and have more time to discuss that information with the person with dementia and their family to help them understand what their diagnosing professional uh, might be gathering in terms of progression. Are there any activities that can slow down speech loss progression? Well, I, I guess I can start. Um, so, you know, the old adage, use it or lose it, really is gaining more and more scientific evidence to support it. So the more that one stays cognitively and socially and physically active, the greater likelihood they're going to have retained cognitive abilities, including language, as they age and even in the face of neurodegenerative conditions, though, of course, it's going to affect them regardless uh, because of those conditions. But you can still help different aspects of cognition to be maintained if you're exercising them with activities that include things like social interaction or conversations. Uh, reading, um, you know, there's a lot of hype around using doing puzzles and all these different apps that stretch your mind in terms of your attention and memory abilities. There's not a lot of evidence that the effects or the positive effects of those extend to real life everyday activities. They tend to make you better at doing that task, but not necessarily generalized to other things. Um, so yeah, but the important thing is to keep yourself active mentally, socially, and physically. Great. Uh, that's great. If I, I, anybody else wants to chime in, that's fine. Uh, otherwise, um, someone asked, when my mom communicates, her words are scrambled. Is she aware of this or does she think she is making sense? And that's really a difficult thing to to gauge um you know people with alzheimer's disease do have word comprehension and sentence comprehension difficulties so in the receptive auditory side of things they are facing challenges and what that means is when it comes to monitoring their own speech they will get feedback they'll hear what they say but it still may not be processed in the way that they thought they said it so the thoughts may not actually connect with the speech in its input uh, cycle. So yeah, and maybe Tammy or Kate can comment on how to, how to try to determine or understand if the person has awareness of their comprehension difficulties. Any ideas? 
I was just going to say it's probably very person dependent as well, um, their level of comprehension. And, and that's that it, there are various methods that a speech language pathologist can use to ascertain where their difficulties are, but it would be very person specific as well. You know, one of the things is you can, this is often used um, with other people with communication disorders is to repeat back to the person what they said. And so not only are they hearing their own voice through self feedback, but you then repeat what they said and see if it makes sense to them. <clears throat> Again, if they have a significant auditory comprehension deficit, they will not be able to understand what you said either. So it depends kind of where they're at on the journey of, of language difficulties. If they're less affected, then they may realize, huh, that really doesn't make sense what I just said, because you just said it back to me and I don't have a clue what you're saying. I'm interested in knowing if there is any way to help the person living with dementia to be able to communicate their thoughts better when they can't find the words or the words don't come out before they forget what they wanted to say. Kate? Yeah, there's a number of strategies uh, that people with dementia can use in addition to their care partners to help them find the word in certain contexts. I can list some examples that I've heard of people using, but it's usually specific to the person, what words they're using and the activity. Um, so some people might keep a word list, for example, in the context where they might use it. So uh, for example, um, somebody might have a list of words they're commonly using when they're calling to make appointments on the phone. So next to the phone, they might have a list of commonly used words or phrases, almost like a script. Sometimes identifying the name of a person might be difficult. So individuals either just in their phone or like in a wallet have a series of wallet cards of images with uh, names and maybe if they need more information, um, their relation to whoever else on the back of the card to just give them a prompt that they can keep either discreetly in their pocket or just with them as well. Um, there's a number of tools that people can sometimes use even just on their smartphones like using the notes app, um, a list of common words as well. And there's other apps that people use to sometimes help them um, communicate in certain activities. Thanks. I, I also really appreciated the quote, Jeff, that you shared, which was um, essentially be prepared to help me, but don't leap in too quickly that idea of there there may be times and so just that overtly asking would you like some help uh finding the word at this point uh, yeah. you know, i think sometimes we find that people are afraid to just ask and have that open conversation but that often is the best way to approach yeah yeah, and just to, to add a couple other things, um, you can ask the person to describe what the word means that they're trying to come up with, so they can kind of talk around it and maybe give you some other concepts. Um, sometimes they might be able to write the word down or draw a picture of it. Um, and then just like us, when we have word finding problems, sometimes it helps to just stop thinking about that and come back to it later. And sometimes the word pops in. So yeah, just some other possible ways to approach it. Somebody shared, and I quite like this. It, it wasn't a question, but I asked my husband, would you like banana or mango? And he answered, yes. <laughs> As someone who also likes both, I think that's not a bad response. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, one person says, I'm finding it harder to talk to my mom, who's in late stage Alzheimer's. Most of the time, she doesn't know who I am, and her speech is becoming quite limited. I have started watching gardening shows with her and talk about the flowers. She likes that. The flowers are pretty, and there's no storyline to follow. She loves to watch Monty Dawn. 
he's pleasant, knowledgeable, and easy to understand. So definitely one of those compensatory strategies that you talked about finding and also the connection, finding a way to, to maintain the connection. That's really good. And there's a, a question, would you use queuing for, ex, for instance, starting with one letter, then a syllable, then an additional part of the word, like you would do with a person with expressive aphasia? I think it, it might be worthwhile to ask the person if that's something that they would like help with. Sometimes, perhaps if they're looking for the word, they might prefer if you just help them find the word and say the word. But if they're wanting help finding the word themselves, then that, that could be something useful if that's a, something that they're actually wanting. And if that is something that they want, some people have found useful, I don't know if, if anybody has heard of a boogie board, but to have a boogie board available that can help also provide written uh, first letter cueing, or the person can even start writing it themselves to help cue themselves if that is something that they're wanting help with. I, I'm gathering from this that the person has um, someone who they don't particularly like, and so they're constantly trying to move away from that person. Well, I mean, this, this kind of fits with <clears throat> what happens often in long-term care homes where people have what are so-called responsive behaviors or behaviors that show agitation or frustration or sometimes even striking out. And, you know, the one of the key strategies in managing those behaviors is to try to understand what's causing it, right? Like what's, is there some underlying discomfort or are they remembering something from their past or what is it? So really the, the strategies of validating those feelings, validating the hatred or the fact that this person doesn't like someone. Um, and and then maybe seeing if they want to talk about it, if they're capable of talking about it. And, uh, you know, sometimes as just for like us as well, just getting it off our chest is a sense of resolve for that, for that anxiety. I just Thank you all so, so much. This was such a rich and um, instructional session for me. Even if I was here all by myself, I would have thoroughly enjoyed today. So thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank you very thank, much. Thanks thank for you. all the participants. All right. Bye. Bye.